don't have a moderator, so we're, we're going to be our own moderator. So things get too out of control, you go to the front desk and get a freelance moderator. So I guess we'll just start with intros. Right. I'm Gigi Rosenberg, and I'm a writer and a writing teacher. And as a writer, I write a memoir, personal essays, and how-to articles for national magazines. And as a writing teacher, I work with artists, artists and writers to help them get their, out, uh, their work out in the world. So one of my specialties is teaching the artists persuasive writing, especially grant writing, and also teaching writers and artists how to do public presentations. My name is Lisa Canning, and I'm an artistic serial entrepreneur. I built my first venture, which was a retail music store at the age of 18 for my college dorm room. That turned into four music stores, a $12 million business, 50 full-time employees, and a big headache. So two years ago, <laughs> I got divorced, sold all, all sold those businesses, and now I've written a book called Build a Blue Bike, Ride Your Artistic Blues to Creative and Financial Freedom, that as a new writer I was able to place with the New York literary agent by the name of Susan Schulman, and I'm going to be published hopefully by a big publishing house. And I'm also building a 501c3 called the Bite Size Arts Ensemble, that's an arts entrepreneurial incubator that I'm going to fundraise for and grant right for, and will produce um, <coughs> income for artists through my for-profit business of Entrepreneur of the Arts. Oh, and I forgot, I'm still selling clarinets through Lisa's Clarinet Shop, that's how I earn my income now. Working 20 hours a week, I, I, I am blessed to make a six-figure income. I make a four in figure income most years. <laughs> Maybe five on a good year. And I'm an artist, and, uh, I'm an alt painter, and I sit, I've been sitting in the attic for the last 24 years and sat all alone. And, and so. so it's a very different world, so I think we're going to have some <laughs> room in. <laughs> I've never seen that kind of money. <laughs> Are you interested in landscape selling? <laughs> she sounds like a client more than a. <laughs> So we can go with the list of canned questions that we got, well, let's start with that, uh, or we can go with the questions from you guys. Um, so unless no one, unless anyone has a pressing, uh, we can start with number one, which is, what is the first step I need to do to get my business started? So I guess I can start. <laughs> <laughs> to get yourself started in a, you know, in a business. Um, you need um, a place to write, and that can be really anywhere. And um, so you don't need a lot of capital, so that's why I think we're gonna be able to give you a good you know, uh, cross-section of different kind of businesses to get started. Um, I find that the most important things to sort of keep me going in my business is to be super, super, super organized. So I'm a writer who sends a lot of stuff out to magazines. So one of my organizational pieces is this triple tracking system that I have. So I can track where my pieces are, what <coughs> magazines they are, how many times I've sent them out, when I'm going to expect to hear back, so that then I can take those dates and stick that in my calendar. That way I can you know, turn to the next day and go, oh, this is the day that I have to call that magazine to follow up. Because I can't tell you how much business I have gotten from the simple act of following up. It's amazing, they go, oh my God, I was gonna call you, but, or even a rejection can turn into an acceptance. They say, you know, thanks for getting back to us. We don't want this piece, but we'd be interested to know other ideas that you have. And then suddenly, it's an invitation to send other ideas and get future work. So I feel like being organized is key. Because if I don't feel organized, I just, I don't feel on top of it, and I can't make phone calls in a, in a secure voice and just my whole day doesn't go right. Um, the other huge thing in terms of getting a business started and keeping it started is to have a very, very good support network of other artists also out there in the world doing stuff. And the way you put that together can be many, many different ways. But I have another woman, she's an artist, she's a writer, and she's also a project manager for other things. And we talk every Monday, and I tell her, this is what I'm planning on getting done this week. Then I have another person I check in with on Wednesdays, and she's my money person, and I check in on what issues around money I've got going on that week. And then I have other people I can call, because working on your own, it's not like working in an office, where if you get a weird call with a client, you can like stop, you know, lean over the next cube and say, hey, this, this happened, you know, can you give me some feedback on what I should do? So I find that I need to have all these established networks set up. 
The other huge thing I do in terms of networking is twice a month I meet with a group of creative professionals. And these are people who are all running their own businesses, all in the creative field. And it's basically a marketing group where we, you know, everyone gets, we split up the time that we have and everybody gets intense time with all of us sort of helping for whoever's on the, got the spotlight at that moment for what their next project is. It's facilitated by a professional facilitator and career counselor so she can really keep us on track and somebody who really knows marketing. But that way, I can't get like lost. It's you know, I've got all these different ways of keeping in touch with you know my people and getting help with the business aspects of um, of running it. But I find that by myself, I'm like half an introvert, half an extrovert, and the extrovert in me needs needs people to keep the introvert happily working. So that's just a couple of tips that I have about getting about getting started and keeping going. On that theme, I call it the A team you need to start with or your action team. I think it's really important to build a team of three people, three because it's an odd number, that are not family or friends, but people that relatively you don't know too well, but that you think that that strengths and characteristics that you wish to have uh, materialize within your own entity that you want to form. And you want to use those people to be able to not only be hold you accountable, but also to take what they tell you and integrate it into part of your process. Your A team should not include your accountant and your attorney, which you do need to have. You need to find the most economical way to have those things when you begin. Um, having coached and helped a lot of people start businesses and jumping into businesses that are six or eight months old, the number one mistake that I have found is that people have broken the IRS's rules, don't know how to file payroll taxes, don't know how to accurately keep their books, and instead of focusing on the business of doing their business, we're focused on trying to rectify all of the mistakes they've made starting their business. And so, um, you know, we all want to cut corners and think it's easier to do without those things. It is absolutely a fatal flaw to not begin with those things. Having said that, um, <clears throat> there are two different kinds of businesses I built. The, one, the first business I built as an 18-year-old was insanely capital intensive. It required a lot of money. Over the course of the first 20 years of the business I was in, I had to borrow literally millions of dollars, which, you know, try being 20 or 22 and telling a banker, oh yeah, I need a half a million dollars right now. So I had to learn an incredible amount about how to carry myself, have enough self-esteem and credibility and understanding how to read a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet to be able to get that money and to know purposefully what to do with that money. I started <coughs> my business on four credit cards. Because one of the things, if you do have a business where you have to buy things and you have to buy a lot of them, you have to produce a, a profit and loss statement that demonstrates that you can earn a profit, manage your money, and be able to move forward. Trying to get a bank loan immediately is very difficult, if not impossible, especially in this economy today. So actually, a lot of small businesses start on either family and friends' money, or mostly, which is a better source actually, is credit cards because it's unsecured debt. Does everybody understand what unsecured debt is? Unsecured debt means that if, God forbid, anything were to happen to you where you could not afford to pay that bill, that the reason that we have bankruptcy laws the way we do it, not that I'm an advocate or am I trying to be depressing, but the point is, is that you're, all of the assets that you have in your name, if you're lucky enough to have a trust fund or have savings or anything like that, um, could all be taken away from you when you sign a personal guarantee. Sometimes they can be taken for, away from you when you file bankruptcy, but oftentimes you can renegotiate if you don't file bankruptcy things like unsecured credit, like credit cards. So credit cards are actually a very nice way to start a venture and minimize your risk if you have to buy things. I'll stop there. What was your business? Excuse me? What were you starting? Um, I started a business that was a series of retail shops uh, around the music industry, and I sold uh, professional band and orchestral instruments, and I also rented band, and band instruments to children. And particularly the band rental business was extremely difficult because I would have to borrow, every year there was a new class of fifth graders, and until those instruments were paid for, my debt kept going up, and although my revenue was going up, it wasn't going up as fast as my debt, so banks would get real nervous, so every year I'd have to keep finding a new bank to give me more money, and you know, it's scary to borrow millions of dollars and have to sign your personal guarantee. Well, I'm more on Gigi's end of it that um, I don't know anything about business. And there's simply no overhead. If you want to be a painter, you can do it on the kitchen table. You, you really don't need anything but a brush and a canvas or whatever you're going to paint with. And I, I, one of the things I think you absolutely do need um, is a, a thorough art education with a lot of art history. So you at least know what you're talking about and, and what the parameters are. 
I know so many artists that when they start to talk, they don't know what they're talking about. And you, you simply have to deal with the tradition of whatever you're going to do if you're going to be a painter. And, uh, and I, again, I, I settled in the attic for the last 24 years. I, I, I never meet anybody. The only relationship I really have to cultivate is with the dealer. They're the person that meets everybody. I appear as an artist. This will be maybe the only time this year. Um, you just work. And, and um, I, I, you know, if I have an opening, you know, every year, that's the only time I'm an artist. But at the time, I just work. You know, I'm, I, I said that work. So it's it's a very it's very different than what you guys are doing. I think. So um, our next question is: Do I really need a business plan? I'll take it. <laughs> The answer is unequivocally yes, you need a business plan. Now, you don't need a business plan because you need a business plan, okay? Meaning it's not like, well, your ABCs, like you have to learn them because you do. It's because a business plan is nothing more than a reflection of the unique attributes and the purposefulness of your intention to act. Your unique attributes and the purposefulness of your intention to act. Meaning that what you're truly doing is stating what your mission in life is, who you're going to serve with that mission, <coughs> what it's going to accomplish, and how you're going to go about doing it, and what the resources you need to be able to do it, and who are the people who might be competing with you around doing it. Now, if you don't know that much, you have no business trying to start a business in the first place, which means that a business plan is essential because it's your commitment to yourself to actually take the action you need to move forward. And one of the beautiful things about a business plan is that everyone everyone who puts one together, including myself, you have to learn how to guess. If you are so inclined to want to read any of my articles on my blog um, under Entrepreneur of the Arts, one of the articles that I've had a lot of comments about is called Guessing at the Numbers. And that article specifically talks about how you go about putting together a profit and loss statement because that has to be part of your business plan. And a balance sheet is part of your business plan. And you're probably going to say, I'm not even sure I know what the difference is between those two things, and, and I don't even know if I do what I'm supposed to put on it. But that's part of the beauty of it is that by doing, you learn. And if you're really uncomfortable, and when you read my article about it, you'll realize how incredibly uncomfortable I was the first time I did it. You'll come to understand that's part of the process. Because by guessing, all of a sudden, you have something to measure against. That's the same reason why you write things down. Because when you write them down and in a week or a month or two months, and you go back and you look at it, you can go, oh my god, I see so much clearly now already what I need to do. Or, oh my gosh, I thought I would do $1,000 a month that I'm doing. 500 a week or I'm doing 10,000 a month or whatever. But the point is you then start to learn how to compare and contrast and actually that's how your business becomes a breathing, living entity is through using your business plan as a model to move yourself forward. So yes, you need a business plan. So from my experience, I usually don't plan. <laughs> I just <laughs> proceed. <laughs> and the benefit I have found of just proceeding without planning is um, sometimes I can plan my way into a corner where I get too scared to take action. So for me, what I do is I do some planning and then take some action and, and then fine tune my planning and then take some action and fine tune my planning. It took me a while to realize that the more I specialized with my writing, the easier it would be to market what I did and the more business I would get. I wouldn't have known <coughs> that if I'd just written the plan and stuck to it at the beginning. So I find it's a dance between planning and doing, and planning and doing, and planning and doing. And one of the cool things I did just this last year for the first time is because of the marketing group I in, I'm in, is we all did an annual report at the end of the year. And we could do it, we could count whatever we wanted to count. So I decided what I wanted to count was how many publications I had contacted, how many articles I had sent out, how many new pieces of work I had created, and I was astounded at measuring all the stuff that I did. And now I sort of have these benchmarks or these marks. So next year I can say, you know, I want to double the, the amount of magazines that hear from me. I want to double the queries I'm sending out. 
I want to double the amount of you know finished pieces I make, or however I want to measure it for the next year. But I have found I have discovered the joy of measuring is that then you can you know see 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 where you're going next year. So for me, it's been a dance in both the planning and the doing, and the planning and the doing. I, I don't know any painters with a business plan, but what you really need is a spouse with medical insurance. <laughs> 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 Number one thing, and but really you do. It's not that formal, but you really do not need to know which track it, it's come up in, in, a, in another uh, panel, and, and then um, Janet's talked about it too, Janet Block. That you 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 figure out where you're going to go if you're going to um, exhibit in, in um, you know serious frontline sort of galleries. That's all you can do. You can't make prints. You can't. Um, you know, showing art fairs, anything like that, because they simply won't take you as a serious artist. And, and so you have to figure out which track you're going to go. And, and, and I'll tell you, my friends that are doing art fairs make a lot more money than me. And, um, but they have to set out there in the wind. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I said in the attic. <laughs> Our next question is, what kind of money do I need to get started? And if I need to get a loan, how do I go about doing that? So I think I'm going to turn to our loan expert, Lisa Cannon. All right, well, let's talk about money as long as we're on that subject. Um, you know, the first loans that I got uh, were character loans. And it is possible to get a character loan. And what a character loan means from a bank is that Lar largely, it usually means that they're trying to reinvest in their community, which means that um, what that really means, just to back up so you understand what I'm saying, is that there's this thing called the Community Reinvestment Act, and banks, you know how all of a sudden we have all of these regional, like these banks that now have all these little, little branches all over the place? Well, they just can't say, like an entrepreneur would, well, I want to open up multiple stores or open up multiple banks. They actually are regulated and are controlled how many they can open. And one of the ways that they're regulated is by investing in their communities and demonstrating that they're actually in support of lending to their communities as opposed to just simply getting to open up billions of branches like a typical entrepreneur. So as a result, one of the things that's in place is something called the Community Reinvestment Act, which means that banks, as promotional tools to demonstrate to the government that they're actually doing their rigor of lending to the community, will find wonderful artists and find people that they consider worthy in the community to offer character loans to, which means that you can go in with collateral as simple as a beat up car and your paintbrushes and paint or a clarinet or something that's really not much of anything and say, I need $50,000, here's my business plan, and would you consider funding me? There are also ways to get loans that bridge those gaps. One of the sources is called the Women's Business Development Center, for all of you men, forgive me. But there are also, um, there are many other uh, resources in Chicago, there's a resource um, called the Art, Arts and Business uh, Council, which also offers connections to banking relationships. But the idea is, is that you want to find a lender or a situation if you need to borrow money that is in a particular point in their development as a bank, that they're willing to actually offer things through their Community Reinvestment Act as character loans, or that you can find organizations like Women's Business Development Center that'll offer bridge loans that are, again, character loans, but that are collateralized. Does anybody know what the word collateralized means? Collateralized is that thing that I just said, like you know, your car or your clarinets or your paintbrush, actually a security, a house. Uh, savings account, something that they can attach themselves to. So sometimes people like an organization, like a Women's Business Development Center, will say, we'll put up the collateral to support the guarantee that this loan gets paid, sort of like a bond, like a get out of jail free card kind of thing, right, if something goes wrong. And so by building relationships with organizations that are in support of the arts, you can sometimes find bridges to be able to get $5,000 or $8,000 or some small amount of money that you need to be able, with a plan, to facilitate the development of your work. As you can tell, I had to do this a lot or I wouldn't know anything about this. If you don't need money, you don't have to worry about trying to get money. But I unfortunately needed a lot of money, so I had to get really used to asking for money. So the first loan I got was a character loan and it wound up getting me on TV. It wound up getting me into their annual investment report because they were doing this community reinvestment thing. And as soon as they got out of their little branch banks, guess what happened to me? 
they didn't want me anymore. <laughs> and the, but the, at least it got me through the gate. And then from there, I could actually go on and get a regular loan and not have the, the I had assets then and I had things to pledge as collateral, now that you know what that word means, so that I could then build my own banking relationships as I need, need them. But it's relationship driven. You have to get to know people who are willing to help you find the money that you need. And it's usually through an organization that they'll help you do that. And it requires financial when you go door to door and you get turned down, how do you stay positive with that? Well, the first thing you have to believe is in yourself, okay? You have to believe that you're doing something so meaningful and so worthy. And, and that means that you have to surround yourself with people who believe that what you're doing is so meaningful and so worthy. And you have to make sure that you get rid of all the people who don't believe that what you're doing is so meaningful and so worthy. So it doesn't mean being, hanging around people who are not business savvy. It means surrounding yourself with your A-team, an action team that will tell you all the things you need to do and that you've done them all to be savvy and to be worthy. But if you are, in fact, doing all those things, if there is a will, there is a way. You will find a way. Just like I told you my story, part of it's coincidence and irony that if you passionately <coughs> embrace something and do all those things, something comes through the back door, just like I told you my story, that isn't what I thought was going to happen to me. Okay? And of course, I took her money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I couldn't find it anymore. But you, you have to keep chipping away. And one of the hardest things, I think, about arts entrepreneurship is that we're not trained to trip and stumble and fall. We're trained to excel and exceed expectation the first time. And in the world of business, it's not about doing that. It's about learning from your mistakes and perhaps stumbling more than you think you should to actually get through the door. And all too often, people stop at step one or two or three instead of step 10 when they actually would have gotten through the door. No bank would loan a painter money. So. <laughs> no, no. But once, once you do make some money, uh, one of the things that I, I have to say is um, I could go six months, eight months without, you know, the dealers don't pay you, and, you know, all of a sudden something sells. It's just when, when you get money, you hang on to it, and um, you don't spend anything when things aren't coming in Well, you got to eat. But um, the market was real good when I started, so I bought my house. There's no expenses. Well, I got heated. But, um, but when you make money, you, 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 you can't just go spend it. You, you really have to hang on to it until the next amount comes in. And I can never guess. I can never figure out how much I'm gonna make. Sometimes I can make eight or nine times as much one year as I made the last year. It's, so I can't forecast it. I have no idea. My friends can't tell me why it's up and down. So you, you just, if you're gonna be a painter, you better hang on to your money when you do get a check. So our next question is, are there organizations that I can turn to for help? I assume this means financial health or information. I guess what I can say in terms of um, you know the writing life, uh, because you don't really need that much money to get started as a writer, but in terms of all that support I talked about, in your communities and areas, find the writers' organizations, subscribe to the to writers' magazines. You know, now there is just so much information on how to be successful as a writer that's out there, and most of it really, really excellent advice. So use it to take your career to wherever you want to go. Now the thing is, although I do have this balance between the planning and the doing, I find that um, it does help me sit down and really, when I sit down and really force myself to think about where I want to go next and just do that goal stuff and then break it down to the little tiny baby steps I need to take to get there, then that really helps me break down the big stuff so I can definitely you know, get there in time. But I feel like I definitely need to uh, rely on the support system of these writers groups, magazines, and just information out there to sort of keep, keep my planet fresh and alive and exciting for me. I agree with that. Um, can you call it absolute right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't use them, but I should. I, I yeah, should there's a forum for writers called Absolute Right, and I actually find it to be a little bit shark infested water like, but um, it's a little scary that site, actually. It's very intimidating. There's a site called Absolute Right. And it's uh, just everything from playwrights to poets to, and they're all pretty intense about their bantering. But it's an interesting place because there's a lot of interesting forums out there if you have a chance to check that out. But um, in terms of organizations, um, I, I have a pretty poor memory. So forgive me for being so lame when I say this and, and for, again, pointing you back so to my blog. I'm sorry. But there is on the sidebar of my blog, I've been digging for about a year and a half, I've been blogging and in doing so. I just keep turning over as many resources as I can for all kinds of different art disciplines, not just music. And I have a ton of resources on my blog to go look in different communities, in different disciplines, 
or support in the arts. And so I would recommend actually looking at it because it's fairly deep. I'm fairly proud of the research I've done. There's quite a bit of it out there, and forgive me for being so general and vague. But um, the one thing I can tell you is that any of the relationships that I've built, like for me, the Women's Business Development Center in Chicago was really key. Um, and I want to share a story with you about it because I think it'll illustrate the point better than the point. Um, I was trying to find a way to get my business funded and I started to make contact with people in various organizations talking about my business of starting a retail store, talking about my progress, talking about how I was getting going further and that I wanted to try to find money. And I started just reaching out to people and talking. Well, about a year later, I was actually really serious about getting the money. And I recontacted one of these women and she said, I remember you. She goes, tomorrow I'm going to get money from all these business plans that I have. If you send me yours really fast, I'll see if I get you funded. And I went, yeah, right. Okay, send her my business plan because I actually talked to her the year before and because I actually followed through and gave her exactly what I wanted from the Women's Business Development Center, people that she'd actually met and counseled and helped their business plans, I was the only one that got funded. And, wow. and a week later, she called me and she was just nuts, like, you got funded, you got funded. And I was like, get out of here, I've never even met you. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I couldn't believe it because I had been pounding on bank doors, going door to door, getting turned down, turned down, turned down, turned down. And I couldn't believe this perfect stranger that I had called a year before and just followed up with actually came through. And, and that was the beginning of my relationship with the Women's Business Development Center that lasted a really long time. And so um, I really encourage you to build relationships with people that you may not necessarily realize where they're going to lead you, but that you take the time to follow up with them. And I must say, from having been in a business where I've hired a lot of people and have, having said what I'm about to say to a lot of people, that it's all too many of you that don't do what I'm about to say, which is that take the time to keep in touch with some of the people you meet randomly just once a year or you know once a half a year just to say hey remember me you met me here i remember your work i've read something you've done you know this is what i'm doing talk to you later and just do it again because somewhere down the line you may find that person to be exactly the person that you need and that is really the blessing of networking is that you don't have to be voracious about it you just have to modestly chip away at staying in touch with people and I must say, most people don't do what I just said because I'm not that inundated, or maybe maybe nobody likes me, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm not that inundated with, with things like that. But the people who do do it stand out like bright beacons because it's amazing when you get those kinds of things and it really touches you and it touches organizations and the people that run them and work in them. I have a question for James. Um, does it help to join, like, you know, there's the Portrait Painters Association of America. Does it help to network with like groups like that to join? Waterfall, Color Society, things like that? Oh, no, I've never paid attention. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however, uh, a lot of my friends are, and the way I really network is through the people, you know, other artists I know that are in the gallery, so it's not a formal sort of thing. You know, I've been in those kind of watercolor shows and things, but I never wanted to do it. And you know, I think you have to be careful with things like that. Like, I'm absolute right. I'll go out there. In fact, I got into a heated discussion that attracted 4,000 people posting who then accused me of using it as a platform for my book, which was hysterical to me. Because the thing I got into an argument with about online was that, why are you guys spending all your time writing 5,000 posts to each other? Why aren't you working on your writing? You know, like, you're so busy going, you know, okay, it's cool. But, you know, like, at what point is it, are you, is it a diversion from what you're supposed to be doing? You know, and, and so actually I agree with him. I don't belong to much of anything, but I know a bunch of people in all the places I need in all those things that I, you know, it's not because I'm not willing to support them because they usually don't require any money. I do actually support some of them I don't attend, okay? But it's more that I don't need to attend them because I know the people in them. If I need to get to somebody, I know who to access. You were talking about the women's business, business development. development. And I was a member of the um, Professional Women's Alliance in St. Louis, and I was just wondering if you had um, found it to be really useful to be around other women entrepreneurs, or mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. Women are, I mean, no offense to any of the men in the room, they should have a men's group. I'm not saying they should. But the Women's Alliances are really cool. They really are. And I also wound up belonging to the National Association, the National Association of Women Business Owners. And uh, actually, they honored me with an award, which is awesome. It was such a cool experience. But yeah, women really bond around each other, and especially if you're an artist in some of those groups, and men should look into networking groups around this too. A lot of times in your communities, the chambers of commerce, there are these networking <coughs> groups that all of us as artists go, Bleh. like, I don't want to go hang around the accountants and bankers and like, you know, uh, 
career consultants or whatever those people are that go to those things. But the beauty of those things is that you're probably the only artist. And that when you go into those environments, most people there don't do art. And so they just hover around you and think you're the coolest thing to slice bread. I mean, that was my experience. Of course, what I was doing, a lot of them didn't know how to buy from me, but they all thought I was cool. But, <laughs> but the point is, is that if you sell actually traditional art forms, there's a lot of it, ability to sell in those environments and to be highly recognized and to achieve a status in them. And the women's groups are really, really good for that. So I would highly encourage that. That kind of networking, especially when you're starting, <coughs> it can keep you going. You seem like a very talented entrepreneur. Is there a reason that you stay in art stuff? Like, do you think you? Yeah, there's a real big reason. Because um, the reason I'm in entrepreneurship is because as a young artist, I felt that there was an incredible amount of talent and not a lot about a lot not a lot of. Um, credibility for artists, and I also saw a tremendous amount of dysfunction in terms of relationships, addiction, lack of money, and for whatever reason, it's my calling. I feel really honored and blessed to see artists who are able to excel and succeed, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to help people do that, because I think it's ridiculous that there's this much creative talent in the world and that we are not the ones leading. I'm tired of seeing people who don't know anything about creativity earning a lot of money and abusing people. And I'm tired in the business world of watching people who are, who's greed. I'm proud of how much money I make, but I do it honestly, ethically, and I work hard to help make sure that I give something back to the people I'm doing it for. And that's not what you see in business. And it needs to change. And the arts can do that. <laughs> I'll go on to question number five, which is, what is the biggest pitfall I should avoid when getting started? Um, I, I think the biggest pitfall is uh, to let yourself succumb to discouragement so that you don't keep getting up and making art every day. Uh, it's easy to, su to succumb if you don't have a lot of support systems set up and just your life set up to really support yourself as an artist. So I think anything that really stops you from actually getting up and making work. Um, the, other, the other thing I've learned over the years is I used to think, and sometimes I still do, that my success would all come in just one big whoosh. <laughs> there'd be one day that would be like, you know, Amazing. dark, and the next day would be light. And I realized that as much life is much more, uh, there's lots of much more shades of gray than that. And, you know, as soon as I get to one place, then I'm, I'm still looking at the next, you know, the next horizon, and then I get there, and then, oh my God, there's another horizon. And I'm starting to come to peace with the fact that it's never going to be kind of all neat, tidy, and just the way I want it. Um, so letting go of that idea that it's all going to happen in one big push, you know. So. Believe what your mother or your aunt says about your work, that you, you really listen to your um, critics, don't listen to people that like you as far as making fine art goes. Um, I remember I was having an opening in, in Chicago almost well, quite a few years ago now, and um, you, that's the only time I meet people, but um, there was a professor that had brought his class in, and you know he was coming by, and he's, he, was, he liked the work, it seemed. I could kind of hear him, I was talking to a client, and, and then he said, if he can do all these things, and then he was ready to really let me have it and say what I did wrong about it. And somebody came, I really wanted to hear the criticism that you know, you, and that's what you need to be able to listen to is is criticism, even if they don't mean to be constructive. You, you've got to sort out things that you know maybe just envy or, or or just viciousness. But you need to listen to the critics and, and to uh, not just dismiss them because they might say something pretty appropriate that uh, you, you you need to change in your work and never trust your dealer. <laughs> I guess I would want to speak to the issue of criticism because I, I think that artists are incredibly um, hard on themselves around criticism because we're criticized so often by the teachers and professors we respect it. And that I think we take to heart perhaps the criticism in a way that's inappropriate. And so I like to think of it like this. Has anybody been outside today? Has anybody even looked outside today? Um, is it blue sky today? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. But I was outside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that it's blue sky today, okay? <laughs> that, you know, it's a blue sky today, I just had a roast beef sandwich with provolone cheese for lunch, and I need to take that piece of criticism and do this with it, okay? And we need to put the criticism in the context of an action item instead of a personalization. 
And then if we can take the personalization out of the criticism and instead make it be something we just either have done or will do or must do, as opposed to something we need to internalize and beat ourselves up over, we're not only much more likely to hear it, but we're much more likely to act on it. Real doctors don't have people write up in the paper, you know, they did this or that, and it was really a lousy surgical, you know, <laughs> you know, we're the only people that get, you know, somewhere there are people hired to criticize us. And, and what's even, you can see the greatest works of art ever done. They're still there. It's not like anybody forgot. And so we're always measuring against those things. So if you take criticism and that sort of thing um, and let it eat at you, if it doesn't propel you, you know, it, it's, you just shouldn't be an artist. You just have to learn to take it and, and grow. But it's going to come. I would frame it you have to learn to distance yourself from it. I don't, I don't know that you have to take I, I disagree with that, that you have to take it. You just have to learn to distance yourself from it, put it in the right perspective, and then actually it serves you completely. And then you can take all of it all of it that comes your way instead of trying to block yourself from it and move around it. All of a sudden you go, okay, that's fine. Independent of the good and bad opinion of others. Correct. Because it's, it's just like the State of the Union. It is whatever it is, and it doesn't really matter, and it's not a reflection on you. It's just simply something to hear and assess and do something with. It doesn't have to become personal. It's only because you let it become personal that it is. The other thing is, you know, you get to decide if you want to, if you agree with that critique or not. And, you know, often the critique is more about the critiquer than it is about the work. So you need to decide, do I agree with that critique or is that person trying to make this piece some, something that's not, that's another piece of artwork, it's not my artwork. And you know there are a lot of unfulfilled artists walking around who are very quick to critique. And I think you really have to think about where the critique is coming from, and if it's something that you know, and, and decide if it's something that you want to work on or not. It, it might the action item might be thrown in the garbage. You know that might be the action item. And also, really, who in fact is your audience? You know, the book that I wrote, I put it out for 50 people to read. And uh, one person was a former employee that when I sent it to this person, I knew right off the bat they would not understand that thing that I wrote. I knew it because I had employed this person and I knew this would be an issue. But I, I you know, and he said, is it a problem? I want to read it because I knew he knew that I would, you know, I wonder. And I said, no, it's not a problem. And, um, you know, he came back and I don't think he learned anything from my book and he did nothing but not understand anything I had written. And, um, you know, that was okay. It was fine because he wasn't my intended audience. And it was fine he wanted to read it. And had I been able to charge him money for it at the time, that would have been better. But you know, it, it's okay. You know, you have to understand who you're shooting at and what you're trying to get to. And you know, I think one of the main points of this conference to me that I've heard in all the sessions I've gone to is that the arts are about learning to find your niche and to flourish within that niche. And if you service a niche, you absolutely will not please a lot of people. But who you will please is the audience and the price that you want to the service that you want to deliver. And you need to start becoming more comfortable with realizing that it's a much smaller segment that you may in your blue sky vision have and that it works. You know, I make the money I make filling six orders a week, six, okay? And I make really good money filling six orders a week. Now I have too much energy, which is why I'm doing other things, okay? But the point is, is that it's not the masses that I'm serving. I'm serving a very small population extremely well, and so can you, if you keep your eye on who your audience is and not let every comment sway you. Do you have a question? Uh, that's for you, actually. Um, um, were there any challenges you faced that were uh, particularly unique to the fact that you started so young, and if so, how did you Oh, completely. That? I mean, when you're 18 years old, and you have to hire employees, and you start looking at talent you know, within five years that's 20 years older than you, man, is that hard for me. I, I went through, like, I needed to see a shrink for a while about it. Because, I, I mean, it was really intense. It was like, what do I know? I'm hiring people that like, have all this experience, and how can I possibly do this? And, and going into banks and asking for money and stuff, when you're, you know, your sense of self-esteem, I mean, I had to learn to get pretty grounded and feel pretty safe, because it was really scary stuff that I was trying to do. And so I was frightened a lot for a good chunk of time. I mean, I, I'm not telling you that I did this painlessly. I'm telling you that I did it purposefully because it meant something to me. But if you think you're not going to suffer and you think it's going to be just a cakewalk, 
at least if you're trying to do something that's really hard, that you consider really hard, you know, it's gonna feel, you're gonna feel a few little inklings of things that aren't quite right. But man, the glory, the glory, there's nothing like the glory on the other side when you get that first thing printed or you get that first work sold or you get a customer that said, I can't, I couldn't have done this without you. I mean, the glory is just, I, I tingle at the thought of that because it's amazing what you can do to help people with your art form when you can turn it into a business. Totally worth it to do it all over again. Anybody else? 